Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Greatly admire the work of Genspect, and um, it's, I'm really looking forward to meeting so many people I've only seen online and exchange words with on um, X. And I think that, um, by the way, um, Stephen Levine's idea of a currently trans-identifying child is brilliant, but doesn't work on X. Um, and it certainly didn't work on Twitter, where many of us formed our ideas, and we had to have this incredibly compact way of, of forming uh, um, uh, our, our expressions. And um, a, lot of that, a lot of the trouble that we've inherited actually comes from those tiny little compact phrases that we had to, um, to devise. So um, in his fascinating book, Sex, Science, Self, Bob Ostertag writes... Beginning in the 1960s, one of the principal rights demanded by queer activists was the right to be left alone by doctors. Today, one of the principal rights demanded by queer activists is the right to receive medical treatment. This fact alone merits our attention. What were the causes and what will be the consequences of this about face? The question and I think Bob acknowledges this, is based on a false premise. In the 1960s, queer was understood to mean gay. You know, those people who are sexually attracted to others of the same sex. You remember them? And they, we, still want to be left alone by doctors. So who are these queers who are demanding medical treatment? And in particular, my focus in this presentation, demanding it for children. They are the leaders and hangers-on of the gender identity movement, which has taken over the gay rights movement. They're the ultimate cuck cuckoos. They have wrecked our nest, redefined us, redefined us, and as for those who refuse to be redefined, they've thrown us out. They're enthusiastically supported by so-called allies, people who are profiting financially, socially, and or politically from this gruesome trend. I'd like to very briefly review some of the interactions between the gay rights movement and the medical profession. In 1952, Alan Turing, the mathematical genius of World War II, known for his momentous cracking of the Nazis' Enigma Code, was convicted of gross indecency at a time when male homosexuality was still illegal in the UK, and he was prescribed estrogen in 1952 as a form of chemical castration. Two years later, he died, probably, though some dispute it, by suicide. Today, rehabilitated, he is honored on the new 50-pound note. Such barbaric practices, along with gay conversion therapy involving cruel and completely ineffective medical assaults based on false beliefs that homosexuals were mad or bad and could be cured had fortunately ended in the UK by the early 1970s. They ended partly as a result of the activism of brave gay rights activists such as the journalist Anthony Gray. Gray was not his real name, but a nom de guerre Chosen, he said, because nothing in life is black or white. We might have a lively disagreement on that point if he were alive today. In the 1980s, governments and the medical establishment were very slow to respond to the plague that became known as HIV AIDS that was ravaging gay male communities. It was gay rights activists who successfully campaigned to get funding for vital research. They encountered numerous obstacles, public prejudice against gay men, lethargy among officials and in the health profession, and above all, a lack of funding. One of the greatest heroes, and now this is Larry Kramer, also encountered furious resistance from within the gay community. Like Anthony Gray, Larry Kramer was not a medic. He had written a screenplay for Women in Love and a raunchy novel entitled Faggots, for which he was lambasted by much of the gay male community for its, some thought, overly graphic depiction of promiscuous gay male sex. When he co-founded the group known as the Gay Men's Health Crisis, 
he had to work closely with medical practitioners in order to understand the nature of the evil they were fighting. And he again faced hostility from within the gay rights movement for the sensible precautions he recommended. I love to remember that when queer activists call us names, as they frequently do. So when I refer to the good and the bad in the relationship between the gay rights movement and medical science, the good is the activism that led eventually to research into HIV AIDS and the invention of life-saving drugs. The bad is chemical castration and gay conversion therapy, including pointless, harmful psychotherapy, which was actively sought by many gays and lesbians in the 1960s and up to the early 1970s, since they had been persuaded there was something wrong and fixable about their sexual orientation. Fast forward to today. These problems have been tackled and largely in developing countries solved. Gay men in the UK or the United States are not given electric shocks, nor are they prescribed estrogen, not for being gay in any case. And revolutionary retroviral drugs can give people living with HIV a normal life expectancy and indeed make the virus undetectable. So what role is queer activism playing today? What is this medical treatment that these groups are demanding for children? As I said, lesbians, gays, and men, and bisexuals are certainly not clamoring for medical treatment to treat our sexual orientation. So the first step towards understanding what Bob Ostertag calls an about face is to realize that in today's world, queer does not mean gay, but has become a fashionable political label often adopted by straight people. A video circulated on X last year featured an earnest young woman who explained, finger-wagging, that if we did not wear a mask at least once a week, we might be gay, but we were not queer. <laughs> Weird stuff. I tried to find her. She's, she's disappeared, I think, because she was shamed off the platform. All those LGBTQIA plus or queer groups are not about gay and lesbian rights. They are united not by anything to do with sexual orientation. In fact, they deny the existence of sexual orientation. Even though many high profile gays and lesbians serve as their useful idiots. They are united instead by a shared belief. They believe above all in the universal existence and primacy of the sexist quasi religious concept of gender identity. With their gender-based definitions, they've effectively dismissed the entire concept of sexual orientation. In order to create space for a public debate on these issues, we must separate LGB from TQ+. And that is why... <laughs> and that is why my organization is called LGB Alliance. I want to focus on the most pernicious aspect, what Mia has been talking about, the most pernicious aspect of the current drive towards medicalization, the fierce campaign to promote puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones for teens and young adults who are distressed with their sexed bodies. As you will have realized, this is the diabolical of my title. U.S. Assistant Health Secretary Admiral Rachel Levine uses his considerable power not just to repeat well-known lies about puberty blockers being harmless and reversible and the alternative being suicide. As Mia already explained, he pressured um, WPATH to remove minimum age limits from um, the standards of care 8, which had initially included age 14 for cross-sex hormones and 15 for mastectomies. The promotion of youth medical transition by the Biden administration is doing unhold harm, untold harm to LGB youth and to gender non-conforming youth in general. Can I please say there is no such thing as gender non-conforming? I mean, uh, it's just a completely ridiculous term, non-conforming, as Mia said, to stereotypes. And I don't think we should use it. I don't know what we should use. This is undoubtedly why one of the first actions of the new initiative, Democrats for an Informed Approach to Gender, is to promote a petition calling for Levine's resignation or dismissal from the administration. <laughs> Le 
Levine's propaganda echoes that of the activist clinicians and non-medical activists of WPATH, as well as all major, this is just so shocking, I really can't, all major human rights organizations, from the ACLU to Amnesty, and in the most profound betrayal of all, of all LGBTQIA plus organizations. And what is the main group affected by this queer demand for drugs and surgery? It's teenage girls and young women, mostly lesbians. Mostly lesbians who, in the feverish atmosphere of TikTok and YouTube, and amid homophobic bullying at their schools, mistake their sexual orientation for a gender identity issue. They've been persuaded that drugs and surgery causing irreversible changes to their bodies will cure their anguish. And like any drug dealer, the advocates of puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and surgery promise a nirvana of love and belonging. Oh, God, I just had an image of Jeffrey Marsh. <laughs> um, and what are the actual physical consequences of these drugs? You will recall some 98% of kids who take puberty blockers go on to take cross-sex hormones. So let's look first at exogenous testosterone, still sometimes prescribed in the UK from age 16 and often available from age 14 in the US. Exogenous testosterone is virtually identical to the anabolic steroids given to female athletes from East Germany in the 1980s. However, when administered to girls and young women in the context of gender confusion, it's not referred to as anabolic steroids. That really doesn't sound very nice. Um, and partly because the anabolic um, effects are seen as secondary, but more probably because it just sounds quite bad. So, well, let's just not call it that. Like, we, we, don't, we don't want to use these horrible words like chemical castration. That sounds horrible. Let's not call it that. Let's call it affirmative and uh, something nice. Um, because in this context, it's been classified as medically necessary. Medically necessary. So the health impacts of exogenous testosterone have been studied at length, and here they are. As you see, they include um, increased risk of heart disease and blood clotting, higher risk of various cancers, elevated risk of diabetes and metabolic diseases, and psychological effects such as aggression. Aggression, been in the, mood, in the news rather a lot recently. Um, clearly, these are very serious consequences. So, taking the real risk of inducing such health impacts iatrogenically must surely be justified by the urgency of treating some terrible disease that is even worse. How about puberty blockers themselves, GNRH agonists? Do we need research on the impact they have? At least one case study of a boy has shown a link with testicular cancer. As for girls, one consequence of puberty blockers administered for any length of time, in some cases, can be premature menopause. So here are the um, health risks of premature menopause, from the low bone density and osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease and stroke, infertility, sexual dysfunction, mood swings, depression, anxiety, increased risk of various things, including dementia and cognitive decline, and shortened lifespan. Clearly, these are very serious consequences. So taking the real risk of inducing such health impacts iatrogenically must surely be justified by the urgency of treating some terrible disease that is even worse. A different perspective. Let's look at um, a, a little-known, very rare congenital condi condition. Hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Hypog, hypog, as medics affectionately term it. In congenital hypog, hypog, there's a problem with either the pituitary gland or the hypothalamus that prevents the production of the hormones of puberty. The consequences of congenital hypog, hypog have been researched far more than puberty suppression in gender distressed children. It's a less con controversial topic, so that research has not been suppressed by ideologues. And here you see the health risks of congenital hypog hypog. Um, 
I must emphasize, I'm of course not a medic or a clinician, and I very much hope that medical researchers will pick up on the points that I'm raising and study them. But I don't think it's controversial to say that puberty suppressants, GnRH agonists, act on the pituitary gland to stop it sending the normal signals to the hypothalamus. In other words, these drugs, it's fair to say, copy or mimic, or to use the medical jargon, phenocopy, the congenital disease, hypog, hypog. And you see these consequences. Of course, a drug-induced condition is different from a congenital disease. But if nothing else, congenital hypog, hypog serves as a model for what happens when puberty is blocked. Clearly, these are very serious consequences. So taking the real risk of inducing such health impacts iatrogenically must surely be justified by the urgency of treating some terrible disease that is even worse. So what is this terrible disease, which is apparently even worse than the increased health risks we've just seen in these three slides? It's gender identity disorder. Oh, no, so, so, so no, it's not. It's gender dysphoria. Whoops. Wrong again. Um, we are now supposed to call it gender incongruence, and I totally agree that gender incongruence... What they're trying to do is bring it further and further away from something uh, pathological to make it to, as if there is literally uh, an incongruence between this thing here and that thing, that whatever that thing is, over there. It's, it is worse. Anyway, whatever it is, it's about profound distress with one's sexed body, something that many many teenagers experience at some point, and especially those with emerging homosexual feelings who are growing up in homophobic surroundings. Do puberty blockers at least help to relieve the symptoms known as gender dysphoria? According to Cass, there's little evidence that they do. A brief digression. Between 2006 and 2011, an American physician named Dr. Mark Geyer prescribed Lupron, a GnRH agonist originally developed to treat advanced prostate cancer, to autistic children. He claimed it cured their autism. Geyer's conduct was reprehensible from many points of view. He was a real rogue physician. But when Maryland State Board of Physicians revoked his Maryland license to practice medicine, the board was particularly appalled by his use of Lupron in children because of its damaging side effects. Why was Gaia's license revoked, and he remains unable to practice anywhere in the US, while hundreds, if not thousands, of clinicians in the US and elsewhere continue to prescribe Lupron or similar dangerous GnRH agonists to children? Why are medical practitioners willing to induce these serious potential health risks and why are so few willing to condemn it? As for a clinical trial of puberty blockers planned in the UK, why is it needed? Who could it possibly benefit? The suicide myth has been thoroughly debunked. That leaves only one supposed benefit as advanced by those who insist there is a benefit. They help boys pass as female more easily as adults. But most of those demanding the blockers are girls who can pass perfectly well if they delay any medical intervention until adulthood. Are we to inflict harm on hundreds more lesbian teens as a sacrifice to the supposed cosmetic benefit for some boys? Given that the known health risks are so serious, I question whether such a clinical trial would be in line with the precept, first, do no harm. Those of us who've been following this issue for years know that it's primarily LGB teens and young people who are impacted by these medical abuses. Anecdotal evidence with the lived experience of lesbians in particular, of course, abounds on social media, and Stella and Sasha have often profiled such young women. But proving that most of the teens concerned are LGB with precise and recent statistics taken from large-scale studies is not easy, since many gender clinics, as you'll have seen in the CAS review, um, don't even bother to ask their patients about their sexual orientation. 
as Cass says, the review has not been able to obtain recent data, and they go back to the older, the, the older data because recently, in the, during the whole explosion uh, in which it was the, the sex ratio was reversed, they stopped collecting this data apparently. And I think the refusal to gather such data is one of the biggest outrages in this whole scandal. Around the year 2000, the trans youth charity Mermaids explained that most children with what was then called gender identity disorder, this is Mermaids, 2000, uh, until 2008 actually. It's, yes, well, anyway, Mermaids, still under investigation, funny thing that, anyway. Um, the, um, they said that most children with what was then called gender identity disorder did not need any treatment and would simply grow up homosexual. This was rather before the, um, the arrival of a certain CEO, of course. Anyway, um, and we have, a, we have a study from 2015, which is often reprinted, um, reprinted in 2020, which revealed that of the referrals to JIDs in that period, only 8.5% of the girls who they were able to study um, were exclusively heterosexual. An extraordinary, I mean, if you just look at that blue line at the bottom and the blue line just one above, almost all these girls were either lesbian or bisexual. But um, more recent studies are hard to find. I think the data is, suggest I, I think it's quite intentionally just not being gathered. The, I think the entire youth transition industry is above all an assault on LGB youth. And I'm exasperated by noting I'm exasperated by noting that even in the rare, vaguely impartial discussions of the topic in the media, this aspect, that it's LGB kids who are at risk, is hardly ever mentioned. But maybe it's not so strange. It's not just the difficulty of citing recent data. There's the more mysterious problem. How to explain to the public that a terrible medical scandal involves inducing serious disease primarily in young, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, and that the main cheerleaders for this abhorrent practice are the organizations that once represented LGB people. It defies comprehension. <laughs> Try explaining that on the radio. I want to pay tribute to a virtually unknown group that called itself Lesbians United. I think they're heroes. They produced an extremely well-researched paper that's virtually a systematic review of the evidence on puberty blockers. And it is from that paper that I derived some of the information I've used here. I can't name the women of Lesbians United because I don't know their names. They have vanished into, I mean, I really did try, I did try, but they have vanished into anonymity. Having produced this superb paper, which I hope everyone who hasn't yet read will read, they evidently found the hostile response too difficult to step into the limelight. So the review, I mean, it really is a very serious review. I do hope people will read it. It um, cites over 300 sources, most of them peer-reviewed scientific studies, and digs into evidence from older and better, better designed studies. Um, and it looks at... Um, various um, health risks, for instance, um, from um, GnRH agonists when used for the conditions for which it has been approved, such as endometriosis. And uh, so an Im immense number of harms which have been reported. And that um, evidence is hardly ever linked. Today's LGB activists, like the women from Lesbians United um, have to endure not just the traditional homophobia that has certainly not gone away, even in Western societies, but the often even more vicious homophobia that has become fashionable in LGBTQIA plus circles. So unlike the, gray, the, gay, the great gay and lesbian rights heroes of the past, Barbara Gittings, Larry Kramer, Anthony Gray, some of today's gay and lesbian rights heroes are nameless. I'd like to demand, on behalf of LGB people everywhere, 
a public acknowledgement that the groups calling themselves LGBTQIA+, or queer, are largely hostile to the interests of young lesbians, gays, and bisexuals. They are like the armies of women who opposed the campaign for female suffrage in the late 19th century. They do not speak for us. I call on medical researchers to incorporate the existing information on the harmful effects of premature menopause, congenital hypog-hypog, and the effects of anabolic steroids on young women's bodies into their studies of the impact of puberty blockers and exogenous testosterone. I'd also like to see the link made to documented harms from um, the approved uses of GnRH agonists. As Bob Ostertag says in the conclusion to his book, the entire experiment of medical youth transition is likely to prove, quote, the next item to be added to the long list of sex hormone medical catastrophes, unquote. To conclude, a sober historical reminder. In the 18th century, thousands of boys were castrated, turned into eunuchs, to preserve their angelic treble voices. When they sang on stage, you could hear ecstatic audience members shouting, Viva il coltello! Long live the knife. I'm reminded of this historical abuse when I see crowds cheering girls displaying the mastectomy scars arising from gender confusion and when I see gender identity extremists proudly wearing t-shirts saying, protect trans kids, accompanied by the picture of a knife. It is frankly insane, and it is diabolically contrary to LGB rights. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Nick, I'm a journalist. Um, sorry for the UK-centric question. Hello, sorry, if you can I see me over you. here. Um, you, you make a very cogent and passionate argument. I just wonder if you are getting any traction with um, politicians in the UK, and if you are, how you're going about that. Well, obviously, we've tried from the beginning to contact politicians in all mainstream parties, and, um, and I have to say that the response initially was terrible from all of them. But we did um, uh, eventually uh, get some quite reasonable contacts, and these, these have grown uh, very reasonable contacts within the Conservative Party. We um, also, um, in the House of Lords, we, we have contact with quite a lot of, um, of, of peers from um, all parties. We know of many, many people within the Labour Party and within the Liberal Democrat Party, I think the Greens have just gone completely mad, so I won't mention them, um, but um, who do agree with our positions, but they, um, they, are, not a, they are not able to speak out. So we, we do our best, we try constantly, but the message has gone out, it's been projected by the queer organizations that LGB Alliance is a hate group, and why are we a hate group and transphobic, apparently, because we do not accept that, um, that you can change sex. We know there are two sexes, and we believe that sexual orientation is a thing, and that you're not attracted to someone of the same gender. You see, the thing is, if you, if you say to a heterosexual man, you're attracted to people of the same gender, he'll say, oh yeah, yeah, right. and he, he will probably not understand that you mean gender in the sense of a self-identified thing. He'll he probably, he, it won't bother him. It won't bother a heterosexual woman all that much. It doesn't even bother, although it's starting to bother gay men quite a lot. Gay men do not like it when a gay, gay man uh, um, uh, finds uh, um, that the, there's a woman in the sauna next to him um, pretending to be a man, which is sex by deception is actually a criminal act. The people who are suffering most are lesbians. I'm sorry, I completely wandered away from your question. <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself? Hello. Uh, good good uh, afternoon, I'd say. Uh, my name is Margaret. Uh, I am an editor from Iceland. We, uh, I run We've got half the Icelandic population here. 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, well, uh, I run the only Maria that uh, really uh, has only Maria has have the nerves to uh, publish about this thing, about the transition and and uh, all the bad uh, side effects and 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 like you know me and Elder, we are the most uh, hatred people in in Iceland by. <laughs> Some group, but uh, first of all, I'm a mother, and uh, I have uh, daughters who, who are in in the school and have been taught this uh, brainwash about uh, this uh, gender ideology. Um, I I was so surprised last year when I I uh, uh, my daughter and their friends were talking about this to me, and their friends. Uh, actually, uh, they said to me, uh, uh, Margaret, uh, uh, we c it's possible. They were talking about the changing genders and stuff. And I said, no, it's not possible to change your gender. They were like, what? Yes, yes. Uh, you know, we are taught it in yeah, school. Yeah, I think it's very difficult and if your question is how you can explain that. In well, it's not, not kind of a question I'm here. I'm just going to say... Uh, uh, actually, what what uh, my answer was about it, I said no, it's not possible. What are they teaching you in school? Are they teaching you about the side effects? Facts, and they were like, what side effects? I say, you are. Oh, you don't know the side effects. You know that uh, that the trans uh, people they cannot have naturally children. Yeah, what? Yes, they can. He said, no. If you're gonna if if you go to, you know try to change yourself if in a in a boy you cannot you're not uh, producing sperm and 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 same with a woman so they get you know they cannot have uh, children so i decided uh, do you want to see uh, pictures so it was like graphic pictures you know after you know afterwards when they have the surgery and actually they were shocked they were shocked to see this so I just wanted to say this is a responsibility for our, you know, us, the parents to, like, this, like she said, uh, in, in the beginning, it's, it's a responsibility to uh, tell the children uh, about the reality. So maybe, yeah, the, the question is, uh, what do you think, uh, yeah, how are we well, going to I, I mean, I've got two daughters and two granddaughters, I, uh, and, and fortunately this... Uh, um, has not happened to me. I, I've always thought that it must be extremely difficult um, if you are faced with that position. And uh, my plan was always to immediately leave and go and live in Botswana until they had... Um, that, that's what I would have done. But then I have the freedom to do that. I have the, you know, I translate. I, it doesn't matter where I am. Most people don't have the freedom to do that. And I think it's incredibly difficult. And also, our children do not grow up in... Um, in, in Holland or in, 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 in Portugal or in Iceland, they grow up online. And uh, they grow up on the internet and therefore the most extreme things that they find, which will be, be for, for instance, maybe from California or Canada, our children, wherever they are, are watching those. It's extremely difficult. And I'm just, um, really my heart goes out to every parent who has to confront this issue. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm Penny and I'm from New Zealand. And I focus on um, looking into what's going on through the education system. And so what's happening in New Zealand, um, and particularly in the girls' schools, is a huge number of girls are now coming out saying that they're same-sex attracted. Now, like, disproportionately, like, up to 75% at some Catholic high schools. And you like using that. those words? And this is, yes, and this is, um, we're seeing it because it's coming through the education system and it's coming through the relationship and sexuality or comprehensive sexuality education. And when we analyze it, there is zero information in there about heterosexual at all. And it's all focused on um, homosexual and then um, trans stuff. So when you talk about um, that, the, that the lesbians are one of the hardest hit, do you see in other countries and in the UK too that you're getting disproportionate numbers of children coming through as lesbian or same-sex attracted? Because I, the way that I'm hearing it from what you're saying and, and what I'm looking at with the data in New Zealand is um, it's the first step of 
the pathway to some children who, if they hadn't have received that education, wouldn't have actually been same-sex attracted? Well, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that at all. I, okay. uh, I don't think that, uh, that, that uh, people become gay because of the in environments that they're in. Uh, and um, uh, one, one, the, one of our speakers earlier um, told me um, a situation where she grew up um, in, in which um, the word lesbian was considered, um, it was only used by men, basically. It was only used by men who um, identified as women and who were attracted, in other words, heterosexual men who identified as lesbians, so much so that, uh, and, and she can talk about this later maybe, um, that, the, that actual lesbians um, would um, prefer to call themselves non-binary or queer. So no, I, I don't think that, um, that being same-sex attracted is the first step towards anything. I think that some people are in fact attracted to others of the same sex. Okay, thank you.